Hello and welcome to another session of Starting Conversations brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. I'm Bethany, your host, and this is our third installment of our series on journalism and democracy. Certainly one of the most important discussions of the moment. It's currently January 2021 when we're recording this. Uh, it's such a pleasure to welcome back our facilitator, Megan Kamrick, who will today be talking about diversity in news coverage, why diverse representation matters, the necessity of a diverse newsroom, and the impacts uh, of diverse journalism and what happens when it's lacking. And I'm really glad, Megan, that you're bringing this to the conversation um, because, you know, when history interrogates particular moments in time, and I'm, I'm trained as a historian, so this is just my personal take on the topic. But when we're researching histories, there's always this question in mind, who is telling the story? And the majority of times history is told by the victors and we have to question the prevailing narratives of the time. And so I think of diverse news coverage as this incredibly necessary component to serving history and the progression of the human story. Because if we're lacking certain voices, then the history is distorted and it's not a complete record. So I'm just excited about this program today. Um, and it is made possible through the generosity of the Mellon Foundation and their initiative, Democracy and the Informed Citizen. And Megan Kamrick, our facilitator, is an award-winning journalist and radio producer based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She is currently the host of All Things Considered on KUNM FM in Albuquerque. She's also a former TED speaker and a current TED speaker coach. She has prepared a great program and a great uh, guest of panelists um, so I'll let her take it from here. Thank you, Bethany. Well, 2020 was in many ways a watershed for issues of diversity in media coming to the fore, the protests for racial justice following the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many others prompted many to examine the inherent racism in our country. And it prompted many journalists of color to come forward with their stories of racism in their own workplaces, both overt and covert. There's also a growing discussion about objectivity where race and gender are factored in and an understanding that what was considered normal or objective was unconsciously understood to be white and male. So in the not so distant past, journalists of color or women or LGBTQ journalists might find themselves defending to editors why they should go out to cover stories that directly impact their communities. And they faced arguments that they could not be objective. Underneath that argument, of course, is the assumption that somehow a straight white man was better able to cover, say, abortion or gay marriage or racial injustice because somehow he has no opinion on these matters. So I want to quickly do a little quick PowerPoint, um, the screen share, and just to give some background. <clears throat> um, this is from the Women's Media Center, does a, uh, whoops does a study every year about women in media. And um, oh, the little thing's covering it, so I don't know if it's gonna work. There we go. The media is in a state of great disruption, but despite all the change, one thing remains the same. The role of women is significantly smaller than that of men in every part of news, entertainment, and digital media. It's clear that a cultural systemic shift is necessary if all parts of the US media are to achieve gender and racial parity and move toward a world where stories fully represent the voices and perspectives of diverse women. Um, this is from a Pew study uh, from 2018, I believe. It's striking because newsroom employees are actually more likely to be white and male than the whole US workforce, <laughs> which was shocking to me. I mean, I knew it was bad, but um, so you can see uh, this little bar graphs there. And, um, oops, sorry, I'm not really adept at PowerPoint. Um, now, the younger generation does this is a little bit more hopeful um, in terms of gender diversity, as you can see, but still, um, still mostly white, uh, the younger newsroom employees. This is also from the Women's Media Center, because a quick snapshot of local radio news, um, which is still mostly men and overwhelmingly white among men and women. Um, and this is just gives you a snapshot of what women are covering in the gender or in the media landscape across wires, internet, broadcast, print. Still, even though we're about half the population, still way underrepresented in terms of who's telling the news. 
and women of for women of color, it's really even worse. Um, women are they're nearly uh, people of color are nearly forty percent. Women are more than half of the population. But the ones who are staffing news organizations don't reflect that diversity, um, which again highly problematic. I this is from twenty seventeen. <laughs> Ash and I both work for a NPR affiliate. I really hope things have changed because <laughs> this is pretty bad. 75% white in terms of racial and ethnic diversity. Anecdotally, I have heard shifts um, over the last couple of years in terms of who's hosting programs on various NPR shows. Um, so I'm hoping those, those figures are outdated, but I am not sure. And why does it matter? I really can't say it better than Gloria Steinem um, missing women of color in newsrooms in this country is an injustice in itself and an injustice to every American reader and viewer who's deprived of great stories and a full range of facts. Inclusiveness in the newsroom means inclusiveness in the news. Racism and sexism put blinders on everyone. So I will stop that share. We can jump in. Um, we have a fantastic group of journalists to talk about these issues today. Russell Contreras is the race and justice reporter with Oxios. And before that, he did a similar beat for many years with the Associated Press. And Monica Ortiz Uribe is a longtime public media reporter. She's now with the El Paso Times, specializing in enterprise and project reporting, emphasizing the changing demographics in the US. Sean Griswold is a reporter with New Mexico in depth, and he is Pueblo from Laguna, Jemez, and Zuni, and grew up in Albuquerque and Gallup. He's focusing on issues important to urban indigenous people in Albuquerque and tribal communities throughout New Mexico, including education, child welfare, and more. Sunny Clutches Chiligi, I hope I said that right, <laughs> is a contributing writer at Searchlight and a member of the Navajo Nation. Her work appears in the Navajo Times, the New York Times, and many other publications. She's a doctoral student and writing instructor at the University of New Mexico. And Nash Jones is my colleague at KUNM Radio and hosts Morning Edition. They are also a reporter with the station. Nash is also on the board of directors at Storytellers of New Mexico, a statewide nonprofit, and the founder, producer, and host of Duke City Story Slam. I'd like to start, if you don't mind, a round robin with, from all of you, if you could talk about an experience or experiences you might have had that reinforced why your presence in the newsroom was so important because of the experience or perspectives you could offer. I want to start, I'll start with you, Russell. I can say there've been a number of instances, but so it's hard to narrow down to one, but I can say uh, um, there have been many cases where there's been a national, uh, there's a national news event uh, and reporters are dispatched to this event. I'm, it's just by nature to look to see how diverse that's, those dispatches are. You know, how many people of color, how many women, uh, if, there's a, if we need how many LGBTQIA uh, reporters are going out there. One particular instance that I can speak up and I've been very vocal about it is when uh, we had Hurricane Harvey strike Houston, my hometown. Houston is one of the most diverse cities in the country. It's, it's where I grew up. It's roughly at the time 30, 30, 30, 30% 30 white, 30% black, 30% Hispanic, although the Latino numbers have grown. Um, and you cannot grasp some, an event like Hurricane Harvey in the city of Houston without having a diverse force go in. You need to know the history, you need to have and respect that history, and you need to know what the dynamics were. And the reason I, I wanted this diverse crew, what I thought it was a morally just move to do, is if you go into a place like Houston and you immediately look to see, say, how the Latino community is affected, inevitably you, you'll say, you'll try to craft stories like how is the immigrant community responding? Well, Houston has one of the oldest Mexican American populations. It has one of the oldest African American populations. In doing so, when the hurricane destroys everything, you're destroying, it was destroying civil rights history. None of those stories got in there. And in speaking out, uh, what I was trying to do is not say, look, I want to go. I'm from Houston. I deserve to be there. What I was trying to say is we deserve to be there. We deserve to have that voice. So speaking out in events like that, I think is important. But I got to tell you, when you do, you always inevitably face a backlash. Either you're viewed as the angry Latino, you're viewed as the angry woman, uh, the 
politically conscious gay guy who, who cannot separate politics. Inevitably that happens. And I think for us that are in those positions, at least I have come to peace to say when I do speak out that there will be repercussions and may hurt my career, but it's the moral thing to do because it's what we have to do to open doors for others. Monica, I wanna to go to you next. Um, can you give an example of like just be, being your presence and your experience, why that was so important in a particular situation or situations? Sure, well, well like Russell, um, there's many examples uh, to choose from, but um, I'll share uh, one, of, uh, one of the earlier experiences. Um, and it speaks to not only my presence, but, uh, but the presence of, of other um, uh, minority uh, reporters. Um, I was recruited for my first job to the Waco Tribune Herald in Texas by, um, by a Hispanic um, news editor who, who took me under his wing, became my mentor, uh, and, uh, and I became um, the only uh, minority fully bilingual um, reporter on staff, which allowed me to then tap into um, other minority communities, particularly the Spanish-speaking um, newly arrived immigrant community in in Waco and, uh, and was able to write stories and introduce this community to, to the city. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, it, it was, it, it, it took, um, it, it took a, um, a fellow Latino editor to, um, you know, to, to help um, encourage my, um, my reporting and my development as a, as a journalist for which I'm forever grateful. What about you, Sean? Um, so my career has kind of taken an interesting turn on where I started with, when I had to first deal with this issue with race, you know, started with one of the very first articles I wrote about um, at my college newspaper, and it happened to deal with the death of a professor with Chicano studies. Uh, my Chicano pro Ch studies professor at the time stood me aside and asked me if this is really what I wanted to do. He was upset that some of the reporting was actually hurting the community. And so I had to really take a you know, deep check into myself as to if this is a career I wanted to take. Of course I did, um, took that into broadcast news where I worked locally here in Albuquerque. Um, and um, one of the very first instances I, I can recall that was just sort of eye-opening. Um, I worked on the editorial side. So our job, you know, picking, evaluating news, gathering resources, picking whatever you can to fill a newscast. We had some stories that were happening on, um, on a reservation, I believe it was Navajo Nation. And there was also something happening nearby in Isleta. Um, and, the decision process in the newsroom was immediately like, oh, we don't cover that. We're not allowed to go there. We just completely dismiss native communities. And for me, it was like, well, no, that's not the case. Like you can make a phone call, you can go to these places. You don't need a passport. You know, there, there, there may be some restrictions at some types of points, but that just sort of complete ignorance of people who are directing local television news for, for communities that, that you know, watch these news, news sources. Um, Native American population, you know, we came to understand through some of the, through actually covering these communities that they pay attention. They, Native, Native communities get their news from a lot of local television sources, whether it's on Facebook or whether it's through one of the TV stations that they can get in their homes. And, and so that became like eye-opening understanding that, you know, if I'm going to be the only Native person in a room, I also need to be able to speak up when that happens. And then on the flip side of all that, like I'm Chicano and my name is Sean Griswold. So I talk to people routinely where, and it's just become second nature now, where I'll talk to people on the phone or I'll talk to people on email and, and they, they meet me in person and they're kind of not sure what to expect or sure to know who I am. I mean, I still have a light appearance and I don't, you know, I, I, I have that, that appearance still, but there's even that experience when meeting a person for the first time in person and they kind of like, their eyes glaze over a moment and they're just like, wow, who are you? What are you? Um, so these situations happen all the time. Um, and one more I can talk about when in another instance in broadcast news, this is when I was working in uh, Denver. We had a series of stories that were geared towards um, transplants. A lot of new people moving into Denver at the time I was there, I was one of them. And we did this quick segments that had that discussed how to pronounce different roads. <laughs> now, I used to call it the cowboyfication of how you pronounce roads. One of the segments happened to do with Zuni, Zuni Boulevard, but in Denver, it's called Zuni Boulevard. And as, a, as, as probably the only Zuni person anybody in that newsroom ever met, I stood up 
I had to be like, hey, everybody, like, sure, we're, 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 we're doing segments that show this is how the community dis discusses itself and its identity, even if that identity is rooted in another person's culture and ancestry, that's still wrong. Even, even, if, even if that's how Denver pronounces it, like you're just wrong, Denver. And, and in that segment, there was a portion in there that actually identified the origins of the Zulu population. And so just having that, I guess, sticking your head out there, I don't know. I always, I'm always also a loud person too. So it's really easy to just be like, hey, everybody, that's not what we should be doing. And it did take me some time to get there for sure. There's, a, there's also some instances where I sat on my hands. Um, but it, it's, it's always evolving. And, and I'm really appreciative where, where I'm at right now because the emphasis is there. I don't have to explain as much as I have to to my editors. Sunny, what about you? Well, I think uh, like everyone else, I've had some experiences throughout my career and early on as a student in journalism as well. But the one that stood out, I, I'm going with the one that just stood out automatically. And um, in 2015, we, the Navajo Nation and the people who lived along the San Juan River experienced the Gold King mine spill that contaminated the local water resources. And there were a lot of outside media coming in, uh, CNN, you know, just all the usual, the usuals, even the state media uh, broadcast outlets. And um, I, I became a, a resource for a lot of organizations. And I remember having to do um, just kind of a quick interview with Al Jazeera. Um, I had a connection with them and I was in the middle of um, the reservation, the Arizona, Utah um, border, border, and they'd wanted the interview right then, there, now kind of a thing, and they just could not understand why I had to find a place where I had service um, on my cell phone. And so I had to explain to them, this is how this works out here, and this is why I have to be, be able to find a place to do this, to give this information to you. And so, and in addition to that, a lot of the stories that were coming out were very surface level, much like what happened early on with the COVID-19 pandemic on the Navajo reservation. It was all the usual things that you typically hear and the focus was, was all on all of those things and not on who are these people? Why is this important? Why is it important that they're dying? Why is it important that they're dealing with these things and how is it affecting them differently? And that same situation happened with the Gold King mine spill. There were a lot of surface level type concentration in, and um, one of the big questions I remember another outside reporter asking me was exactly why is this a big deal for native people? I mean, it's just, It'll, it'll eventually clear its water. It'll, you know, kind of clear at some point. And, you know, and I feel like that's what prompted one of my stories to, to be focused on why is it important to Navajo people? I mean, there were elders who were crying because of the contamination and why were they? Why was it such an important thing that they were losing these, these resources? Because it wasn't just about water. And so had that perspective not been given, then perhaps a lot of people might not have known exactly why we were making such a big deal about this. And that was really what it came down to. And so, you know, with COVID-19, it was a lot of the same thing. So I focused a lot of my stories on projecting who we are as a people in the dem different demographics. I started with the first story of um, introducing a little bit of our history and a little bit of who we are in a specific community. And then I went off on kind of tangents, focusing on elders and then later focusing on women. And I did that very, um, consciously because I knew the stories that were out there and how surface level they were and what they were focusing on. So I felt like it was important to, 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 for people to know not just that, yes, we deal with these disparities, but we also do some wonderful things. We also have a very rich culture. We also come from a very valid place that not many people can say they come from. And so, um, so I think that that's an older, an older experience and a more recent one where I felt like, you know, it's, it was important to have that, that voice and to, to be that voice essentially. And Nash, what about you? Yeah. Um, well, so I'm, I'm trans and non-binary and I, uh, 
I do the local hosting for NPR's Morning Edition across Central and Northern New Mexico. And part of my role is to um, promote the NPR stories that are coming up later in the hour. And so I get language from NPR, kind of boilerplate language. And there's been a few times where I've had to kind of adjust some, some language to be more gender inclusive, more trans affirming. Uh, that stands out to me, you know, um, a story that might be about pregnancy, something involving pregnancy. And the language assumes that everyone who's pregnant is a woman, you know, and then it goes on to say, you know, uh, pregnant women or this thing about pregnancy and women need to be aware of this. And so just changing something really simple, like pregnant people, people who are pregnant, those who are pregnant, and making sure that that language is including, including anyone who might have the ability to be pregnant or who might be impacted by that story. But those are all promos, right? And so I don't actually have the ability to, to do anything about the story that's going to air later in the hour, but it's a way for me to, um, to kind of own some of that content and as a trans person to say like, this is how I'm going to phrase that, even if it's this national story. And I feel like while maybe some of my cis listeners wouldn't even notice that that happened, um, I know my trans listeners do for sure. And then I also know that um, it's helping adjust the way we conceive of these kinds of things, you know, like the media has this power to phrase things in a way that allows folks to start to conceive of pregnancy as a, as a, a human um, you know, phenomenon uh, that, that folks of multiple genders may have the ability to go through. Mm -hmm. um, there was one story recently, um, I believe it was over the summer, um, where I did feel the need to actually uh, make an, a correction coming out of an NPR story um, that was about a trans person and the reporters uh, referred to that person's gender as their preferred gender. And uh, I heard it and just felt like I immediately I needed to issue a correction because it's just not accurate. So it felt like how I would issue a correction after any inaccurate report was delivered. And I felt like as the uh, as a, a trans reporter, it was, you know, I felt very compelled to do that. So coming out of the report, um, we came back into like kind of the local break and I just, you know, on air delivered a, a slight correction that, you know, the, the, the reporter mischaracterized trans people's identities as a preference. And just like cis people's identities, trans folks' genders are authentic and real. And coming up on Morning Edition and just moved on, but like it felt important to, to name it um, for myself, just, uh, but also for all of our listeners that heard that. So to make sure that that I was kind of reframing that for folks and and just calling it out. Mm -hmm. um, and I know also I'm part of a morning edition host group that I was the only morning edition host of that group, at least that that noticed it, that said something on air. Um, and so I think maybe most cis reporters might not have heard it in the way that I heard it um, or may not have felt so compelled to, to speak up and say something about it um, right on the spot. You're in a Slack group with other Morning Edition hosts around the country. So you talked about that. Was that sort of educating yeah. them or did they appreciate it? Yeah, yeah. Some folks definitely said, oh, thanks. You know, I didn't even think of that. Um, some folks, I think, heard it uh, in the report and were like, I'm not sure about that, but um, either didn't feel confident enough or maybe supported enough in their station to say something or quick enough on the draw to be able to really pinpoint what was problematic about that. Um, of the group, I was the only one who said anything. That leads into my next question really well. And, and I meant to say at the beginning, uh, sometimes I have specific questions for all, but also you should feel free to jump in if you want to, I want to have a conversation, but I'm curious what, um, what are some stories that media outlets are getting wrong about your communities? If anyone feels like jumping in. I'm sure there's a wealth of feeling, especially with the election. Um, people were shocked, shocked that you had people, uh, Mexican Americans along the border who voted for Trump. They were shocked that um, folks, after all the rhetoric the president said, that people would endorse his um, views that were anti immigrant. Um, not seeing the nuances of Latinos, not seeing the nuances of, of Mexican Americans. People have made assumptions about this population. And quite frankly, in the coverage, 
it skews more a lot of times towards Cuban Americans. And the reason that is, is because Mexican Americans in Texas and California, the largest population, live in deeply blue and red states. So the politicians campaign in Florida because it's a swing state. And when they talk about Latino issues, it centers around Southern Florida and Miami-Dade County where Cuban Americans uh, have a, a large portion of the population. And so therefore their issues become to the forefront. They make the national news. And the assumption is everybody in South Florida, their views transposed to McAllen, Texas or Albuquerque, New Mexico. And when reporters do come to New Mexico or come to Arizona, they are shocked that nobody cares about Cuba. Nobody cares about Castro. Nobody cares among Mexican Americans. They can even identify who the president of Mexico is. I guarantee you, if you go to El Paso, probably not El Paso because they're much more educated. It's much more of a bicultural area, but say go to Houston, Texas and pull out any Mexican American off the street and ask them who the president of Mexico is, they'll probably say Pancho Villa or Emiliano Zapata. They have fundamentally different um, uh, concerns and um, things that overwhelm them politically. They're worried about immigration, yes, but also education, jobs, race relations with African Americans and whites. And I think when we look at uh, the Latino vote or anything like this, the assumption that, that reporters make is that we all have a totality of experiences and it's not. You can pull someone different from Houston to LA and they're gonna probably come up with different, different political conclusions. A lot similar, yes. And many times they'll end up on the same spot, but the migration patterns are different. When you come to Texas, you're more than likely from Northern Mexico. If you're from California, you're likely from Southern Mexico different indigenous tribes, different experiences that transcend generations. And I think you cannot lump these groups all into one and put them all in the same bowl and then expect them to vote in a political block consistently in election after election. I think about that, um, Sean and Sonny, uh, but Native American coverage, because there's over 515 <laughs> tribes in the US which are incredibly diverse in where they are, what their experiences are. Um, and, and we saw from that, what was it on the CNN, the election night when they were breaking down the votes by um, ethnicity? <laughs> and they didn't have Native Americans, it was just other. So, um, which thankfully prompted a lot of discussion about Native Americans and voting in the election. Um, but yeah, I do you do you all confront this when you're talking with national outlets or when your experience and working in your own outlets? I think Sunny hit it on the head to begin, so I think she could finish that thought where she was talking about just <laughs> blanket coverage of people who come in, fly by, and just do a blanket or very I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm not even discussing this right. But Sunny, I think your point was on. I, I think you have this. Uh, yeah, well, you know, this reminds me of um, the conversation that, which was a good conversation that happened about how Native Americans, specifically in the northern Arizona part, really pushed the Arizona vote. And how I remember my my very first tweet in response to, to the stories that were coming out about that were, we've been here, we've been doing this for a very long time. And I remember sharing that with my dad, because my dad is very... He's very um, in the know about politics on the reservation. And so our, my parents are very active in voting and that's how I became a very active voter. And so I remember them uh, telling them about, you know, how this news was coming about in the, in the outs outside of the reservation. And my dad was like, so, you know, like that's, we've been doing that. I mean, and I mentioned on Twitter, I said, voting is becoming a, it's a cultural thing at this point because it's a known place where we go to the polls, 
We see people we haven't seen in a very long time in our communities because a lot of, specifically for Navajo people, a lot of the, those who live off of the reservation are still registered to vote in, in their Navajo communities because you can vote there tribally, you can vote there for the state, and you can vote there for the nation. And so myself and my parents are like that. We all vote in our chapters, our respective chapters. And so going to vote is one of those things that you really look forward to because you get it's like an all-day thing if you will you go there you see people you, you haven't seen in a really long time relatives you you know that you're going to get fed um there's always food involved um so there's a lot of camaraderie and a lot of um it's you know just a community social type of a thing and so i mean that's why my response was the same as my dad's when these stories started coming out of oh they really pulled through for us oh you know they're the reason why you know but it's like we've been here we've been voting we've been a part of this you know for a very long time and so i think that for me that i was just I was a little, I was a little bothered by that because it made it seem like, oh, we just came out of the woodworks all of a sudden and decided to start voting and really helped with that initiative when, when in reality, you know, we've been here, or we just haven't been noticed apparently for, um, for a very long time. So um, in that whole something else, it was actually something else that CNN had up on their screen. And um, I saw that in a delay. I wasn't watching. I, I must have been out reporting or something. But I saw that, you know, once it had happened and I, I didn't get to see it live. But um, <laughs> I remember my dad asking me, what is that? And I said, that's you, apparently. <laughs> and I said, you know, like, that's just how forgotten that we are, that we're not even considered a category at this point. And so, um, you know, the response, I think, to that was a little bit, um, you know, as Native people, we enjoy, I wouldn't say we enjoy, we sometimes respond to things in humor. You know, we see the humor in things and, and you know, there was a group of people who did do that. And then there were others who took that very seriously and said, no, you know, Shieja, you are not my child. You are not something else. You are so much bigger than that. And so, um, so it, it, it generated an interesting response. But I think in terms of the election, kind of going off of what Russell was talking about, um, you know, that was something that it just was completely wrong in my opinion, just because, you know, it's, it's the reality is, is that we do come out in numbers, so. Mm -hmm. And I want to add something to that topic too, because I think where you're seeing some of the narrative of Native American voters coming out is the fact that you're starting to see Native American led voting coalitions have power and, and promote elected officials and get to the point where they can also promote narratives like that, that benefit their greater cause. And I think that goes to the another another person a mis misperception that Native Americans aren't taking care of their own, aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, with within my coverage in the education topics, education coverage in New Mexico is about equity, and what that means is that New Mexico is is basically under a legal guidance to restore and repair its ed its education system. And this was centered from a lawsuit that was brought forward. It's called Yazi Martinez. It's brought forward um, by Native American advocates, uh, English, English learning advocates, and, and people who were um, advocating for disabled students. What was the misconception in all that is that it's all the state's objective to have to fix all this. When in fact, when you follow it on the ground, you're seeing educators who are doing multiple jobs as a teacher and as, as well as writing curriculum that is focused for indigenous students or, or English learning students. You're seeing administrators who work within tribal school districts take on the role to repair all this. And I think that's what I enjoy most about, about my coverage is that um, I, 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 I purposefully seek to find sources that are either, that are, that are mostly indigenous. Um, I write some of these really wonky education articles, which I kind of joke about because I never liked school and now I'm covering school. <laughs> um, and to see that I can have seven, eight sources and they're all from different tribes across New Mexico. Now I only cover 23 tribes. You mentioned there's, there's a lot of tribes across the country, 574. And so 23 is not a significant number, although it's a significant, it's 10% of the population in New Mexico. So there's a, there, there's a purpose in my reporting to find the sources of people who are on the ground within these communities who are building this new education equity that is gonna be, that, that is the priority and the focus for, for uh, changing New Mexico. 
one thing I talked I've talked to people about um, at a conference once when they had a little table about uh, producers of color and women um, in media and how to sort of tackle this. And I said, well, don't bring up diversity. And they looked at me and I said, that's like people look at that as broccoli. So if you're talking to a news director or, or uh, an editor, it's more about um, how do we get more readers or more listeners? <laughs> we get a bigger audience because that's the very nature of having a diverse newsroom is you're going to tap into more stories and communities. And I wanted to ask Monica about this um, because you have done a podcast called Forgotten the Women of Juarez. And um, it seems like a perfect example to me of like, if you don't have diverse newsrooms, you're missing stories. I mean, that seems like the biggest argument. Obviously there's a justice argument and equity argument, but if you have to get to the pragmatism with your news director or your editor, I'm like, what stories are you missing? And I want, so I wanted to ask you about this podcast, Monica, what prompted you to do it? And why were you in such a good position to do it? Well, it's funny that you um, you bring up that podcast in the context of uh, diversity, um, because there's certainly more than one way. There, there's so many ways to think. There's diverse ways to think about diversity. Um, and and to, to your last question, I wanted to point out that one of the many ways we can think about diversity um, is not just the who in diversity, but the where in diversity, the geography. Um, I was looking at that same Pew study um, you referenced earlier, and, uh, and it indicated that um, one in every five journalists is located in either DC, um, LA, or New York. And a lot of the things that people get wrong, that I, all the, a lot of mistakes that I've seen um, about the place that I cover, the US-Mexico border from El Paso have to do with uh, geography. Um, the, uh, a, a couple of years back, uh, Bloomberg Business Week put on, um, if not their front cover, one of the first pages, a photograph um, looking at the Franklin Mountains into El Paso and labeled that photograph as Juarez, Mexico. So they were pointed at the wrong, wrong side of the border and, and mislabeling um, the, the place. Um, and so I'm heartened to see that, uh, that there, is, there is some attention being played to geography and where um, reporters are, are located. Um, I mean, El Paso has been a huge focal point um, in, in the news during the Trump administration. And how many national um, reporters, correspondents are based here, you know, the AP used to have one, but other than that, um, you know, few few others. The Dallas Morning News has a correspondent here, um, but, uh, but but yeah, my argument would be that when when it comes to diversity, we need to think about uh, geography as well. And Definitely. Place, um, place correspondence in, in places where 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 they don't exist. Um, and then in terms of what what stories are are we missing? Um, well, certainly, um, the, this, I mean, when, when it came to the podcast, um, for me, it was highlighting our neighbors on, on the other side of the border who contribute to a lot of our, our well-being here in the U.S., but because there's a, a wall and a political boundary that divides us, we don't often think of who lives on the other side of the border and what contributions they're making to, uh, to our lives. And so for me, um, a huge part of that podcast, uh, which centered on uh, decades of murders of women in, in Juarez um, uh, was to highlight the fact that many of them worked for um, foreign owned, the majority of which are American factories, and they're making the components that make up our everyday lives. I mean, it could be, you know, the, the microphone um, uh, that, 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 we're, that, that I used to record that, that podcast, the seatbelt in our um, in our car, um, the flat screen that we watch our Netflix on, um, our iPhones, our laptops. Um, for me, that was uh, an important story that, uh, that that we were missing. Um, and while they not while while they're not in the U.S., uh, they are they are our neighbors and they contribute. That's such an important point to make. You even said I think I was reading um even uh, making PPE for the during the coronavirus pandemic, right? So you're bringing home like how connected we are, even though there's been a dialogue of like, oh, that's them, they're over there. Yeah. 
um, Nash, what do you think media is getting wrong in terms of stories and right, if there are good examples about LGBTQ trans folks about that community? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I've seen a vast improvement in a short amount of time. I feel like there's been a shift over the last five, six years of uh, getting better. There's just more awareness um, and you can see it in newsrooms, you can see it in style guides, um, but for a long time and, and still today, um, I think there can be an overemphasis um, on trans bodies and transition and um, uh, kind of some sensationalized depictions of transition, a lot of before and after pictures or asking people really invasive questions about what their body looks like or their medical history when maybe that's not actually relevant to the story and it's it's a, a curiosity um, and it, it can be really problematic. I feel like I, it stands out to me, there was an interview and I, I don't know exactly the year, maybe 2014, 2015, um, Laverne Cox came on uh, a short-lived daytime show that Katie Couric had, and um, Carmen Carrera, who's a trans model, was on the show as well, and Katie was asking her some really invasive questions about her surgery status, and Laverne Cox came on and just live on the air, like schooled Katie on why that was inappropriate, and um, it's like sparked this huge conversation in media coverage that, you know, why would you ask that kind of question of a, of a trans guest on a daytime talk show when you would never ask a, a cis guest that same question? And so, um, you know, Chelsea Manning changing her name and, and pronoun and, and transitioning. That was a huge touch point where um, as we have more trans visibility in the media, um, I feel like those conversations have been shifting um, and, and there's more kind of understanding of where those boundaries are and um, thinking about how to tell those stories um, more responsibly. But also, you know, I think something that I see a lot is that trans folks are often the sources in stories about trans people or stories about transness in general. Um, I don't see enough trans sources um, on general topics, you know, it's almost like two ways. It's like, I think sometimes I see trans folks not treated as the experts in our own experience and stories that they have to bring in a cis doctor or somebody who's an expert on immigration rather than talking to the, um, you know, the trans immigrant about their experience, they have to bring in this expert um, on the more general topic. And so I think it's important to treat trans people as experts in our own experience, but also that trans people can be experts in all sorts of other things too, <laughs> and not just on, on trans experience and, and uh, diversifying our sources. It's almost like um, you see it a lot in like TV and movies, any, you know, uh, an LGBTQ character, a, a character of color, or a character living with a disability, where their whole storyline is about that identity and that experience. And they can't just be a general character living their life in this, in this rom-com or whatever. Um, I see that in the media as well, um, often in, around um, sources, trans sources, and, and what they're asked about and what they get to be experts on. Um, so that's, that's something that stands out a lot to me. Um, one, one last one, I guess, that comes to mind is uh, dead naming trans people. I think that has been shifting more. Dead naming is when a trans person's referred to using their, their previous name or their given name. Um, it used to be the standard that it felt um, like you had to do that in order for the report to be accurate. Um, and I think there's a recognition more and more now of how damaging dead naming is for trans folks in the media. Um, in, in community, that name kind of gets used both in two ways. Um, that it's your dead name, like your name that, that died, that name is no longer around, it's, it's your old name. But also, um, some people use it to mean like the name the media would probably use if you died, um, to report that you died, um, that it might be the name that, that they use for you. And um, it's, it's tragic and so damaging. And when somebody has passed away, you know, it's, it's so important to, to 
be sensitive to how you're representing them in their life. And um, it can be it can be really um, a horrible thing for for somebody's legacy. And they're not around to speak up about it. But um, fortunately, I think a lot of trans journalists, but also advocates in the community um, have taught um, newsrooms quite a bit over the last few years about um, the impact that that can have on folks. And so I, I do see a shift. And I'll just jump in and say full disclosure, Nash had to do a little educating of me. <laughs> and they were very gracious about it. <laughs> so I appreciate that. You bring up a really good point though, about um, not taking people as like being the experts in their own lived experience. I'm wondering if any of you've had this experience with your editors or with other supervisors when you're told like in a story, I'm like, well, can you go find that expert? Can you go find that like, whatever, white guy to reaffirm what your source said? Has that been an experience? All the time, you know, it, I'm, I'm so grateful I'm at Axios now where they let me be the expert and me and, me, and myself decide. In almost all my sources, I would say 80% have been people of color or women, uh, in my, my, and that's what they want. But I've been in other news outlets where they say, can you find the expert that can weave through this grass fire here and calm us down? And what they mean is, is get a white person to come in and calm down uh, your, your people of color who are at each other's throat on issue X. And I will say on the issue that you brought up about news editors eating the broccoli about diversity, look, if newsrooms don't eat their broccoli, they're going to lose their heart. You're going to have a heart attack. The way this country is uh, developing and diversifying, readers are now responding when you don't have diverse stories and you don't have diverse voices in there. You see this in California, you see this in New York. Um, we sometimes recognize that and I think we internalize that because the way our stories get elevated, even out of New Mexico, if we wanted to transcend our state and our region, a lot of times in our various outlets, it will rest on the decision of somebody in New York or somebody in Washington. Mm. And when we were, I was at The Wire, we had a number of techniques that we did to transcend that. It was stereotypical, yes. If we had an accident, for example, 10 people dead, they didn't think it was important. We joked that if we said this accident happened 250 miles from the Adobe cover Taos Pueblo, someone in New York would say, oh, that's a wonderful story, even though it had nothing to do with Taos Pueblo. We, I mean, to be fair, we did the same thing in Massachusetts if something happened, if we said it happened close to the Kennedy compound. Somebody in New York would say, oh, I love this story. But in New Mexico, we recognize in order to get, get because we don't have the numbers, we sometimes have to navigate, navigate these stereotypes. Okay, we'll give you what you want. We'll mention an Adobe X or something just so that you can focus on the importance of this following story and why it's important. Now we resist sometimes because I, I can tell you, and Sonny can probably talk to this, if you're talking about native communities, inevitably someone from New York or Washington will want you to mention the dogs, right? The dogs are so, so bad, I can't believe this. So much more that they're so focused on the mistreatment of dogs that they forget that there's people across the street that don't have plumbing, you know? The hell with them, it's this poor dog here. So. Those are things we're constantly negotiating. And I'm so thankful I don't work for a company that does that at all. They allow me to go out and tell them what's relevant tell, and to bring that to the readers. But we're constantly hit with these pressures. And sometimes we give in, we make these sacrifices to get to what the heart of the story we want out there. God, now, I don't know if Nash feels the same way. I'm like, I just got some insight into why AP stories are written in a certain way because Nash and I are using those for our newscast. I'm like, why did they put that in there? <laughs> I'm really sorry, but you know, it, it's the only way that I get that I actually was able to get it to your desk at times. <laughs> Anyone else want to chime in on that? <laughs> I, I would like to, I was thinking, um, and I thank Nash for bringing that up about, especially the idea of um, experts um, 
and how, how diverse that can actually be and looking to the people who are experiencing what they're experiencing. And I think that that was the number one thing I made sure of when I joined Searchlight. Um, those who know, I, I left journalism actually, or I tried to, <laughs> and then only came back when the pandemic hit um, because I felt like it was necessary to, to use my experience. And so um, one of the things that I made known at Searchlight was I don't, I don't put the limelight on um, politicians. I don't put the limelight on leaders that I tell stories from the people. And so my first couple of stories are, all of my stories very are very heavily focused on pe the people and their experiences and what they're going through with this pandemic. And my latest story, which is on Navajo women and how um, their matriarch roles are um, very vulnerable right now with the pandemic, um, it actually starts with a politician. And that was a very, very hard thing to have to do, but it was hard to, I, that's how I wanted to start my story with that image. And so it was it just, it was the best image in my opinion to have to do that. But I really grappled with not focusing on another person in my story, which I would have preferred, but that was one of the rare cases where I was okay with it. But, um, but I make a point to make sure that the focus is on the people themselves and for the same reason that um, I write the stories that I write because if you look at CNN you see President Nez all the time. I mean I think 90% of the time you see Navajo leadership and while yes they are the leaders of the people but it's the people who are dealing with this every day. It's it's the, the men and women who have to haul water. It's the grandmother who's taking care of her children. You know, it's those people who we talk about are dealing with these things, but we never hear from them. And so I really like that idea of looking at the people to be the experts. And I think that it's something more mainstream outside media needs to focus on, especially locally. Um, you know, when I see the broadcast television locally, I see President Nez probably every single day on local television. And so, and while I think, you know, um, again, I think it's important to some degree, I also think it's important to hear from the people themselves. And going from a going from, from a reporting stance to a personal one, I actually experienced this with the New York Times. My very first column that came out in regards to the pandemic was a column that I'd written for the New York Times. And um, <laughs> I had a few Navajo words in, in the article, in the column. And if you look at it now, none of them are there. And the reason for that is because they, we had a really hard time validating the words, how they were, how the words were written in Navajo. And so, and one of them in particular was, I mentioned that I mentioned a home, a homestead on the reservation that my family and I visited. And there's a name that we know it by in Navajo, but you're not going to find it in a Navajo English dictionary. You're not even if you ask a Navajo translator, which I did, how you would say this or write this in Navajo, they had different interpretations of it. And so when I put that in there, they said, we need to figure out how, where's the spelling coming from? Where can you point us to, to show us what is the correct way to spell this? And I said, it's coming from me. It's coming from my family, from where we come from and how my great, great grandparents knew this place. And it wasn't enough. So they just took it out altogether. So that was, um, that was, uh, it was my personal experience. And I think that, you know, Russell said it at the end there that we make some of those sacrifices. And for me, it was more important. It was so important that that perspective just got out that I just said, okay, you know, I guess fine. If that's, if that's what it's going to take for me to have to get this story, this one story about this huge problem that's coming out that probably won't be be out there anytime soon, which it wasn't until months after, then I guess that's what I have to do. And so, you know, I was really disappointed in that, but, you know, that was just something that, um, honestly, it was my first experience with the mainstream outlet having to do that. Before that, I'd written for the Navajo Times for 11 years. It was my first job out of college. And so I never had that problem. I never had to tell somebody, validate your language, <laughs> the language that you speak and know. And so, um, so that was a personal experience as well as a professional one.
Hi, Sunny. I'm sorry that you had to, um, that, 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 that's, that that was the outcome and that was the price you had to pay to, to share a story that, uh, that you felt was important, that was very dear to you, that people needed to, to hear. Um, I can echo that sentiment somewhat um, in, in, in the podcast um, uh, that, that, that I did about a subject that's very dear to my heart um, and talking about, well, you have to make certain sacrifices in order to get a wider story out. Um, um, I, I was not the only co-host. Uh, I, I was a co-host on that uh, on that podcast, and um, my my fellow um, host, um, who I have very much respect for, and I enjoyed working with very much very much and I'm very grateful. Um, you know, he was a white male outsider and, uh, and he actually pitched this story um, and came to me and brought me on board for which I'm very grateful that he did so. But uh, when it came to um, sharing the microphone, I argued time after time that we shared a little bit more equally. And, um, and I got, and, and, and the response was, uh, was, was no, this is the way, just trust us, trust us. This is the way it has to be. And certain things, you know, ex explanatory things about the region, about the place, about how it functions um, were given to my co-host where I felt I should speak with the authority. I, and I did in many, in many moments, but, uh, but not as, I don't think the, the microphone was shared as equally as, as it could be. And uh, that was just something I had to um, accept. And, um, you know, that's probably my largest critique of, of the work. Um, um, beyond that, though, um, um, to, I, I, will, I will say that in terms of thinking about diversity in multiple ways, um, it was a fantastic partnership between me and my, and my co-host in, 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 in another way, in that he was an outsider and I was an insider, and we had completely different perspectives. Um, I like to describe um, him as the satellite and me as the microscope, and, that, and those combined um, uh, points of view, I think, help to tell the story in a much stronger uh, in a much stronger way, and so that that was a, that was something that surprised me about the partnership, but it was something that worked, and it's again another way to think about diversity. That's a great point, Sean. Did you want to add anything? Uh, the story that comes to mind in this experience, because yeah, I, I can relate to everything there, um, but the one that came to mind was 2016 when I was when I was in Denver. Uh, Standing Rock was happening, and um, our newsroom was was receiving you know almost dozens of uh, news pitches a day asking us why we weren't covering what was happening in Standing Rock. And I've been following you know some local sources as well as sources that were online. Um, so so I had some awareness about what was happening, and I also was getting in tap with um, uh, the Native American population in Denver, which has so much connection to that area, and that like that for many people that is their homeland. So these are people who live, you know, eight, 10, eight, 10 hours away from, from, from their home and they're wondering why we're not covering this on their local TV. Um, unfortunately though, like the multiple emails a day was actually dissuading the newsroom from covering it. It was almost like we were, it was almost like, yeah, that, that the newsroom was being bothered to cover this significant topic. Um, and to Russ's point, it came down to me having to not only explain the, the activist and the, 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 um, um, the, the, the urban population that exists in Denver and why this is significant to them, even if it's 10 hours away. But then it, it, what really actually mattered was that I, was, I now had to understand and explain to my editors was that while well, people from Denver are now being arrested, people from Denver are now being assaulted. That was the localization that ultimately led us to send the crew out there. And once we did, it was just eye-opening for everybody that was there. This sudden hassle became like a, a like a congratulatory, like, hey, thanks for getting us out there. You know, the the stories that we did, uh, and, and one of them won an award, and so it ultimately was a success for our news station. But just the scratching to get to that point to make it that we have to be there, and then to ultimately the only reason why we're going is because people are now being arrested and abused and hurt, and that's now the story. I mean, that yeah. ultimately was the, the the bigger impact of the story. But that's how you localize it was 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 a little bit of appalling to me that, that it took that much to get there. Um, and then to the point about just, you know, going and finding white at white, um, uh, you know, sources of who, who can sorry, white white sources who are credible, who can validate whatever claim is being made. Not only does that happen, but it's also 
I'm given lists of white people to go interview as if the editors already have this institutional knowledge that I think goes back to the diversity issue because they're going back to the same sources. It's the same list of white people that are that we're told go interview that person because that's the person that we have have, have selected to, to be able to speak with credibility on this topic. You know, uh, many journalists this year were really open about how exhausting it's been in their career to constantly educate co uh, colleagues about issues of equity around race, gender, et cetera. And it sounds like you all, you all have had to do that in one way or another. How has that impacted your career and your work? Because the work we do is already exhausting. Well, I can say that um... I'll say, I, what I can say is this, yeah, it's affected. Um, it's affected my reputation. It's affected um, how I move up, how I moved up in my previous companies. Um, and it's affected how I'm viewed by some colleagues. But I gotta tell you, I would do it, do it again because I, none of that would have got me to the place where I am now, where that, that type of ethos is respected. And so I feel like, the elders before me, especially I, I had an uncle who was involved in the civil rights movement. He told me that this would happen, but that in order for you to be blessed in your eyes, the way we see things, this is what you're obligated to do. This is what he did. Um, and this is the only way that I would have been in position to do what I did if he had, it, based on the, what he did previously to open doors for me. And, and so I think uh, we brought up, some of us that we have an obligation to open doors for ourselves and um, for the people that are coming afterwards. And that does mean taking more blows. One of the things that, uh, that I'm at peace with is no matter what happens, missed opportunities, I didn't get this beat, I leave a job and then the people after me get paid higher. Everything that, that I'm at peace with, I know and realize that is nothing compared to what happened to the previous generation, what they endured. They had to do it life and death situations. They had to do it death threats. So I have nothing to complain about if I'm looking at that, if I'm looking at that perspective. I do know and see what lays in the future for those that come after. They're going to have a much more inclusive newsroom. They're going to have a much more inclusive environment. Hopefully they will see that they have to continue to do the job that we do. And then our work as, as we become older and elders is to not give up and not stop what we're passionate about. So I would tell everybody on this call that not only do we, should we continue that, but we should also open up our eyes to other marginalized communities. I can say this is when I was unity president, um, I did not immediately go and wanna have town hall meetings about Latinos. I went straight to Pine Ridge, right? After that, I held a town hall meeting in Dearborn to talk about Islamophobia because besides Sean and Sonny, everybody on this call, we were once strangers in the United States and we have an obligation to learn about everybody else. So um, even though we may uh, endorse some things, we also have an obligation to in solidarity and in kinship with other marginalized people in the newsrooms to come to common, uh, some sort of common curse and realize that it's the totality of our experience that will make our newsrooms more inclusive. But it is hard as to be the only one in the room saying, hey, you should know this thing, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. A absolutely. When you when when you think some basic things, whether it's a pronunciation, as Sunny said, or say a cultural norm, as Monica brought up, it it's frustrating. But then again, uh, it is nothing compared to what the our, our predecessors had to endure. Megan, um, I want to bring up a, a different point before we uh, before we close. That when 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 newsrooms think about diversity, um, you know, I mentioned it's not only who, it's also where, um, but also we have to think about how uh, how we're paid when we um, when when we are hired. Um, it's it's not just about hiring diverse d diverse reporters, but uh, but about uh, paying them fairly and equally. Um, the LA Times and the Washington Post uh, reporter unions did some studies a while back. And um, you know, sadly, but not surprisingly, they discovered that women and employees of colors were vastly underpaid compared to their uh, white male uh, counterparts. And women of color were the ones who were paid um, the worst of all um, in, in 
in one case, um, a, a difference of 30000 $30, dollars was the was the largest pay gap, um, and these were often for these were sometimes for jobs that uh, that required the same skill set and the same level of experience. Um, so I just wanted to point out that that's something that's also very important when we talk about diversity in in newsrooms. Well, I thought about you, Sunny, because my friend Carla Murphy did a survey this year about journalists of color and why they leave the profession. Um, and I don't want to put story to what your de life decisions were, but you had decided to leave journalism, go back to academia, and you've been, you've been pulled back like so many of us are. But has that been a factor for you? I mean, is, it, is that one of the reasons you decided to leave? It's just um, kind of uphill battle all the time? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I grew, up, I grew up very humble on the reservation. So, I mean, to me, I grew up understanding that, you know, a job was a job. And for me, I was just lucky that my job just so happened to be something that I really enjoyed doing. Um, before ending up at the Navajo Times, I actually never worked um, on worked for my people. Um, that I feel like it just became, I took it as something that a gift, um, something that needed to happen. And so at, at first, I mean, being 20 something years old, that's not the most ideal um, job to have, but I was very lucky to have it. It's an experience that it's a very hard thing to get um, to be able to, to, and a very rewarding one to be able to write about your people and for your people and work for them. And so um, it wasn't necessarily having to do with, you know, not being paid well enough. It was just, I'd lost my grandmother in 2013. And for those who know me, I was very, very close with her. And um, she was one of my teachers growing up. And so um, I really valued and appreciated the fact that she was so generous with her knowledge. And so I, I kind of had a realization when she passed that that was something I needed to do. I knew all of this, whatever it was that I knew about writing and about journalism. And at the time, I also took on a second job as a tutor at the tribal college. So I was working two jobs and I loved it. I loved being able to share everything that I knew with Navajo students, Navajo college students about writing. And so I just wanted something where I could merge both what I had learned as a journalist, but also this new path that I was taking as an academic. And I at heart, I'm still very much a journalist. Better yet, I'm a storyteller. And so um, that was something that just was never going to leave me. And I knew that um, when I left journalism, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving journalism, but it's not really going anywhere because you can't exactly lift what I've learned in the 15 something years I've been doing this. And so um, I always knew I would return to it. I just didn't think it was going to be when it happened last year, shortly after I had left it. And so, um, so that wasn't necessarily a factor in, in my leaving. It was more just, I wanted to expand my skills so that when I did return home, I could offer so much more than just being a journalist, though that is a lot as, as it is, but I wanted to I just wanted to be able to go back with more tools. And so um, so journalism found me and I think it was just telling me that, um, no, you can't leave us or you can't leave me. You're not going anywhere. We need you, your people need you. So you just need to, to continue making it work. And so that's what I'm doing. Um, but I, going back to what you said about, you know, it being exhausting, you know, I think that that definitely is there. But like Russell, I, I look back to what people like my grandmother endured. My grandmother didn't speak English, but somehow she knew so much. And so um, and she went through a lot in her lifetime, including being hidden from um, BIA officials so that she wouldn't be shipped off to boarding school. She was the one child who didn't go to boarding school, so she didn't know English. All of her siblings did. And so um, I felt it necessary to take on what she had, she had taught me and what she learned in her lifetime and to share that with others. And that's what I do now with my immediate family, my nieces, my nephews. And that's how I look at this, this work in journalism is it's a calling. I mean, less than 1% of journalists worldwide are Native American. And so that's a statistic that's been the same since I was a student journalist. And so knowing that, I know the importance of what I have to do in, in educating others, in, in being that point person if necessary, because 
if I don't do it, who else will? Um, there's so few of us still left in this industry. And, you know, Sean is, of course, one of them as well. And I'm glad to see him still here. I've, I've known him for some time in, in his journalism career early on as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's a duty. It's a call to duty. And it's one that I'm more than happy to take on because I know that I, I, I can say I don't know who would do it if I didn't. So, yeah. Sean, I know you feel comfortable speaking up a lot, but do you ever get tired of always being the one speaking up? Yeah, for sure. I do. Um, in fact, I burned out. I did. I had to burn out. I stopped in 2019. Um, I left news. I thought I was done with it all. I felt that I wasn't doing, living up to the ethos I cared enough about with journalism, which, which is part of the calling, which is to me to do no harm. Um, and to represent the communities that that all happen and whether or not it was that you know diversity or being the the loud one in the room or just the pace of the of the news environment and the overall infrastructure of news crumbling around us it was a mix of all of that I'm sure um, and I was ready to be done with it all honestly I was about ready to go to business school and get an MBA and then this opportunity happened with Report for America and New Mexico in depth which was highly focused on working in coverage that I cared enough about that I felt should be done in a way that even my even my editors who recruited me to this position felt that it needed to be represented by by somebody with my background um and and I do I take this responsibility very very seriously because I don't know how long or how many more Native Americans are going to jump into this honestly I think to Monica's point about pay Journalists don't get paid anything, and for when you're coming up from a from a from an area that is like poverty or poverty adjacent or even lower middle class, why are you going to be a journalist when you can go get a, a job, you know, as a as a plumber and make significantly more money than I do? Like I've had these conversations with like my cousins and relatives who, who who look at my job and think it's glamorous and enjoy the, the light that I have, and then we talk about income and they kind of laugh at me. They're like, "Why are you doing that?" So there also needs to be that incentive because the calling is there for some of us, but we also need to figure out an incentive for the people who have that calling who stick with it. Because I've seen so many who are, are journalists to color, who have the passion, who, have, who, are, who are better journalists than I've ever been, who just leave because the, op the financial opportunity is greater in a different sector. And so I think that, that there, yeah, the, there's a lot of being around, I started in 2008. My first job was at the Santa Fe New Mexican. Um, it was a summer intern there, actually, and that was when the New Mexico. That was 2008. Was the time when there was the the big economic first economic crisis. Um, the Santa Fe New Mexican had just moved into their swanky downtown renovated office. It was beautiful, um, two story old adobe right off the plaza, and it was empty. It was mm. it was a ghost town, and I was told by editors at that time to like, why are you doing this? Like, get out. And I have to also fight that urge sometimes when I talk to young journalists, like asking them, why do you, why are you doing this? Because this is a, this is a difficult life. But I think with the responsibility of what we're doing when it comes to building, understanding with communities to, to tell our stories, to be able to understand that journalism is still a tool that can help out and that can do good in this world. Um, if you can explain, if we can explain that way and incentivize individuals who have that behind them, I think we could grow this overall effort. Nash, I want to end with you because um, you're still you're relatively new to journalism. I will say uh, you've had probably the experience in the last year because of the nature of 2020 of like 10 years of experience, uh, and you're still here. What are you thinking about for the future for yourself and what you want to do in journalism? Mm. Well, you know, I um, I have had a wild uh, rookie year of reporting. I um, I had been hosting for a while, but I never felt like I was going to be the kind of host I wanted to be without uh, doing some reporting. So I just started in in January on um, doing actual field reporting and, and general assignment stuff. Um, I have appreciated the work. You know, it's 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 the work I feel um, called to do. It's, uh, it feels like exactly how I want to be um, showing up during the pandemic that I feel like I'm able to, to really 
make an impact. And that's been great. And I feel really fortunate to have started um, at a public radio station. You know, that's kind of where I plug into it. And I really enjoy that aspect of, uh, you know, it, it would be different, I think, if I was at a paper or elsewhere. I, I really enjoy um, public media and the values that public media has. You know, in terms of the questions you were just kind of going through around um, sustaining yourself in the work. You know, I think it's important to, for me to own that, you know, I have a lot of privileged identities that intersect with my, my trans identity and that necessarily is going to inform the experiences that I have. You know, um, I think my, my trans identity becomes most visible because of my pronouns, right. That I use gender neutral pronouns. That's a place where it becomes like, um, there become some barriers to inclusion in a newsroom or on air. I've had listeners write in about the the fact that my pronouns are grammatically incorrect and are those according to the NPR or AP style guide and am I allowed to use those? Like there are definitely places where it's hard for me to plug in, but um, there's also places where where it's really not where where my identities align with the norm and and like those those uh, numbers you were sharing at the top, um, overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly uh, masculine presenting, if if not um, men, um, and so and I, I don't identify as a man, but a lot of people read me that way, and that's going to inform how they see me when I come in for an interview or when I'm uh, out in the field, no doubt, and so I I. I notice that and I, I definitely know that that's informing my experience and my energy level to be able to sustain myself, those kinds of things. Um, but I'm appreciating the work. I'm, I'm glad to show up however I can in um, advocating for more diverse newsrooms and reporting that centers the experiences of the folks that are most impacted. And so I feel like I'm able to do that here. Um, maybe at this station in particular, or the, in this newsroom in particular, I think we've got leadership that supports that. And as we've talked about today, having leadership that is on board is huge. Because if you're coming up against a brick wall, it's going to be real hard to sustain that fight. Right. Well, I think we're all very lucky that you all are still in journalism and bringing us these stories. And I really appreciate you coming and, sh and sharing your experiences with us here today. Bethany, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I just, I really appreciate that this conversation has, um, has ended on this note of, um, you know, the sort of responsibility or the, even the burden of labor of what it means to be a person who holds these identities um, that have been traditionally underrepresented and, and, you know, that, that sort of what's at stake for, for each of you individually. Um, when you are, when you are in a newsroom, when you decide to return to a newsroom, um, so I really appreciate the the note that this has ended on, and um, I would just like to express my gratitude to all of you for um, your generosity and coming here and sharing your story. Something that's been really rewarding and fulfilling for me. Um, listening to all of these starting conversations has been. Um, sort of seeing the the subjectivity behind um, all of you journalists who, you know, people, journalists have been under such attack for the past five years, especially, and um, people forget the humanity in journalists and um, and the people who are behind these, these news stories. So as important as it is to lift up the, the communities that you're reporting on and to tell the stories in your communities, it's also equally important to um, shed light on, on your your backgrounds. And so I, I'm really appreciative of you joining us. Um, and below this video in the YouTube uh, comments are going to be a, a list of resources um, provided by, uh, by you all and Megan. And so please feel free to, um, to all the people who are watching this, feel free to check those out. Also definitely check out the past two convers starting conversation series that Megan has facilitated. And uh, we'll see you all later. <laughs>